On this episode of What's Going On With Shipping, negligence versus gross negligence. A California judge dismisses the case against a dive boat captain in the death of 34 people. Hi, I'm your host, Sal Mercaglano. Welcome to this episode of What's Going On With Shipping. If you're new to the channel, take a moment, subscribe to the channel, hit the bell so you'll be alerted about new videos as they come out. So this is a, a serious case. A California judge just dismissed the charges without prejudice against a dive boat captain, the death of 34 people, 33 passengers, and one crew member. Now, the case can be refiled in court, but the issue the judge came up with had to do with the definition of negligence versus gross negligence. And not really so much the definition, but what was applicable in this case. And this deals with maritime law. Now, let me be clear. I am not a maritime lawyer or a lawyer at all. I'm married to an attorney, but that does not make me an attorney. I am, however, a former merchant mariner. I have been schooled in admiralty law, well-versed in it, and I have studied many cases involving admiralty law in maritime history. But what I want to really ask that question is, should negligence or gross negligence be the measure for what happened in the case on board the Conception? And more importantly, what was the root cause for the issue here? And was it even just negligence on the part of the crew? So let's go ahead, go ahead and take a look at the case. So this is the Reuters story that was on G Captain the other day. And so let me summarize the major parts here as it goes on. So again, this happened back on Friday and this judge in Los Angeles went ahead and, and dismissed the case. Uh, District Judge George Wu said in a ruling that the indictment handed down in December of 2020 against Captain Jerry Boylan by a federal grand jury must be thrown out because the prosecutors had failed to accuse him of gross negligence. The charge against him was negligence, but you'll see why they filed negligence in regards to the statue they were using. A spokesman for the U.S. Attorney Office in Los Angeles said prosecutors would seek authorization from the Department of Justice to appeal Wu's reeling, uh, ruling. Excuse me. Going down here, the indictment accused Boylan of causing the deaths through, quote, misconduct, negligence, and inattention to his duties. That is actually the specific element from the statute. This is the statute in question, 18 U.S. Code 1115, misconduct or neglect of ship's officers. Every captain, engineer, or pilot, or every other person employed on any steamboat or vessel by whose misconduct, negligence, or inattention to his duties on such vessel, the life of any person is destroyed, and every owner, charter, inspector, or other public officer through whose fraud, negligence, convenience, misconduct or violation of the law, the life of any person is destroyed, shall be fined under this title or in prison not more than 10 years or both. This is the statute. It has been around for a long time. It actually came out pre-Civil War. It has been updated over time. But basically, if you are a licensed merchant mariner, and that's what they're talking about here with Captain Engineer Pilot, and Captain Jerry Boylan was, he held merchant marine credentials to operate a vessel with paid people on board, you have to hold a certain license depending on the size of the boat. If you have just six people on board on a fishing boat, you get the six pack license. If you're under hundred tons, which I think this was, you have a hundred ton license. If it's over that 1600 tons or unlimited tonnage, the federal prosecutors use this code as their element. And what it says here is you have to show misconduct, negligence, or inattention to his duties. And that was the onus they were doing it. Judge Wu, on the other hand, said something different. Going back to the Reuters story, the U.S. District Court's grand jury cited three federal safety violations. One, a failure to assign a night watch or roving patrol. That is key, and you'll see why that's an important one. Second, to conduct sufficient crew training. In other words, making sure the crew was well-trained to fight fires should a fire happen on board, and then finally to conduct an adequate fire drill to let the passengers know what to do in case of a fire. What you'll see here is that the passengers did not know what to do. There is not one certain case that really set the standard for this law, but a series of them. But the, the most egregious is the destruction of the Sultana on April 27th, 1865. This was a steamboat that was overloaded vastly overloaded. This is a ship that was could carry about 350 people and it had about 2,200 people on board. It's the end of the Civil War. They were repatriating Union prisoners of war, a lot of them from Andersonville, up the Mississippi to their homes, 
when as the steamboat was after departing Memphis, one of its boilers exploded and it had to do with poor safety, poor maintenance on the vessel. The vessel burst into flames, a very famous image of it right there, burst into flames. And it's estimated that over 1,195 people died in this explosion. And this has really set the standard for mariners having to provide certain levels of care and standard. And it's why they're held to the negligence level, because negligence on ships can lead to the loss of lives very easily. And matter of fact, very tragically, as we see in many cases. And the issue here is whether or not that standard should be applied, or as Judge Wu says, it should be to the uh, gross negligence standard. So the National Transportation Safety Board did an inspection and a report on the fire that took place on board Conception. They released it 13 months after the fire. And in it, they were very extensive in listing the conditions and their findings, which was a long list of findings about what contributed to this fire. They did not determine a cause for the fire. They suspected an electrical incident that took place in the salon, which was the main area on board the vessel. So this vessel had basically three decks. The top deck was the bridge, and that's where the crew lived. The, mid, the, the main deck, which was out to the stern where the diving area was, also had a large, uh, what they call salon, which was the eating area, the assembly area, the galley. And then down below on the aft side was the engine room, which was compartmented off. You couldn't get to it except by climbing down from the main deck. And then below deck forward was the berthing area for the passengers. And the only way in and out of that berthing area was through a stairwell, the very forward end of the vessel, or through an escape hatch aft center of the vessel, which was really hard to see and find. And it's really small too. And one of the things they note here is that the ship met with their requirements for smoke detectors, but lacked smoke detectors in the salon area. They also made note of the fact that there was a lot of electrical devices plugged in, in the salon area. And this is because everyone brings every camera in the world with them. They charge them up. And a lot of vessels, older vessels, can't handle the electrical loads. But the big issue they raise here is point number 10. The absence of a required roving patrol on the conception delayed detection and allowed for the growth of the fire, precluding firefighting and evacuation efforts, and directly led to the high number of fatalities. When you go to the report, this is the section on the roving patrol. Requirement to keep a watch at night while passengers are embarked on a vessel has been confide, codified in U.S. law for nearly 150 years. Law came into effect when vessels were primarily constructed of wood and the advent of steam power greatly increased the threat of fire. The threat of fire has been reduced by modern engineering, fire detection, and fire extinguishing equipment, but the law has remained largely unchanged since it was originally enacted. While the probability of fire is less, the consequences of a fire, particularly on a wood vessel carrying passengers, is warranted the continuation of legal requirements for a watch at night. If you've watched any episode of Below Decks, you know that there's always a night watch, that the crew is up there monitoring the vessel, make sure that you don't drag anchor, make sure nothing gets close to you, and you're providing a fire watch. This vessel did not have a fire watch. They, there was no night watch. Everybody went to sleep. Everybody on board the vessel was sound asleep when the fire initiated in the salon area of this vessel. And what happened was the passengers below deck and the crew members who were sleeping below deck were never able to escape because the exits to the salon area were cut off, both the primary and the secondary one. The crew, which was above the salon area, had to abandon ship because the fire was so intense, they literally had to leap off the vessel, swim back onto the vessel, and attempt to do fire suppression, but they were unable to do any fire suppression because the fire was so out of control. The NTSB reports, and I apologize for having to say this, but all the passengers were alive and awake, knowing of the fire. They found them dressed, not in their bunks, and all of them died from smoke inhalation. Now, most people in fires will die from smoke inhalation, not from fire itself. It's the smoke that kills you. And that's what happened to the 33 passengers and one crew member on board. That's the schematic of the vessel right there. The bridge deck or the upper deck right here, again, there's the wheelhouse. There's your bunks for your crew up there. The main deck right here, this is the salon area we're talking about. You'll see these two ladder ways right here. 
This leads you up and down, up onto the bridge deck and down into the uh, forward area. This takes you actually down into the area. So you see you're coming into the bunk room area. And then you have this one little yellow hatch here, which pops up into the salon. That is the escape hatch. That's the only way. There is a barrier here between the bunk area and the engine rooms. There's no access here at all. You've got to come up into the salon to get out. And this is where the fire started. Cut off the egress route for the for the people below decks. It engulfed the upper deck. The crew had to abandon ship, jump, and then swim back on board. You can see why it was such a big problem. This is the escape hatch down in the bunk rooms. You'll see it. It is tiny, small. And then you come up here underneath this counter uh, area right here. And again, this is where the fire was. So even if you can access the escape hatch, you are not getting out through that escape hatch in any way. This is the remnants of the boat. They brought ashore at Port Wainimi where they could separate it out. What was left of the upper deck, the main deck, and then the below deck. And you can see it's segregated here. This is the bunk room area where everybody was who was trapped the shower room area up in the forward area. And again, when that fire took place up in the salon area, it cut off their only way of escape. So this chart shows you the ability of the crew to be able to fight the fire. This is life-saving and fire safety equipment. So if the crew had found out about a fire in the salon area, whether it's up here in the galley area or back here, there's a couple of ways. So the crew could come down, grab a portable extinguisher on the upper deck, begin to fight fires, there are two more portable extinguishers in the salon area. There are two hose reels mounted outside the salon area so you can get water on the fire. You can fire up the fire pump right here. And so you can uh, control the fire pumps right here or from the bridge uh, controls and use that. And then down below in the crew space, there was only one, uh, excuse me, in the passenger space, there's only one fire extinguisher up here toward the forward bulkhead. The engine room had fixed CO2 systems and portable CO2s, but you don't have fixed CO2 systems in a birthing area. You don't ever want to take the chance of releasing CO2 into a birthing area. And, and obviously once this fire was fully involved, there was no way to put it out. And so th that comes to the issue here about negligence versus gross negligence. And what we have here is Judge Wu is basically making this argument that uh, negligence standard was in, in, in uh, citing from an Associated Press story right here. Wu said that the case law on the negligence standard was inconsistent in appellate courts. Only a New Orleans appeals court had upheld the requirement that prosecutors prove simple negligence to win a Siemens uh, manslaughter uh, conviction. And basically what he's saying is that this that this law is pre-Civil War. Well, it's been updated since then. I think it was updated in 1948. And therefore, it's showing a, a different standard. Now, understand Boylan, the uh, uh, captain, had already got a ruling in his favor. They initially had filed 34 cases of manslaughter against him. They reduced it down to one, uh, saying that the 34 separate cases were not individual ones because under the statute for every death, you can be charged for that. They had him down for just the one. Now, normally you get a plea deal out of this, but there was no plea deal that was coming out of this case. Uh, what we're seeing now then is how this will be applied. The district court uh, prosecutors have said that they're going to refile this. And I don't know if they're going to allege, you know, that, that Judge Wu was wrong in his, 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 his judgment and try to make a motion to hold to the standard of negligence or if they'll go to gross negligence. And the difference, of course, is negligence means, you know, you, you just don't pay attention to something and it's through error that it happens. Gross negligence means you wantonly make this happen. Now, I firmly believe, and again, I'm not an attorney, so don't take my legal advice at all on this. But I think the lack of having roving patrols is gross negligence. Did Captain Boylan and the crew know that something was going to happen? No, but they were also not in a position to prevent anything from happening with a delay. I mean, they would have to wake up. They would have to be alerted to it. I mean, even if a boat crashes into them, if they drag anchor, I, I mean, I can't tell you the number of things that I will run in my head as a mariner that can go wrong on board, not the least of which it's flooding and sinking. Uh, I, I don't know how everybody on that boat goes to sleep with that many people on board in a compartment space that has very little access in and out of in case of an emergency. 
And I, I think you prove gross negligence without a problem. However, I think the measurement is negligence. I think we hold negligence to be the level for a couple of reasons. These 34 people are on a tour bus. I mean, where you can call 911 and fire an emergency could come get you. They're on a boat off Santa Cruz Island, minutes, hours away from any sort of assistance. They are basically putting their lives in the hands of this licensed crew who basically their lives depend on them. Food, uh, survival, everything. I, I mean, you are putting your lives in the hand of a crew, much like when you get on an airplane, you're putting your, your life in the hands of that crew. And they should be held to a different standard in many ways. You know, is it negligence that you don't have a roving patrol? No, it's negligence if the roving patrol doesn't see what's going to cause the fire. It's gross negligence when you don't have the roving patrol. Okay. That's that to me, again, not a lawyer. That to me is the gross negligence. And I, I have no ill against anybody here, but you take as your duty when you put passengers on board a vessel, their lives. And you're supposed to have that measured effect in there. And if you are going to take the calculated risk, hey, I'm going to get a good night's sleep, uh, then you're taking the risk there. And unfortunately, what you have here is 34 people dead. And would they have been dead had the roving patrol been awake? I don't know. Because I don't know what caused the fire. I don't know how fast that fire got out of control. I mean, even if you were there and saw the fire happen, you know, you know, if you didn't have enough extinguishing agent, you couldn't get a, a fire extinguisher on it fast enough. You know, who knows? You, you don't know. But I will say this. They had a much better chance of survival with a roving patrol being on deck than they did with this. If you had somebody up in that wheelhouse, somebody walking the deck, they could have smelt the smoke. They could have seen something. They would have been alert the minute something happened. Uh, there could have been a lot more response to this. And I think it's just a, a, a terrible tragedy. And again, it goes on the difference in how the maritime sector has laws and rules against it. There's a reason there's admiralty law, why there's laws of the sea versus laws of the land. <sighs> Tough subject. Hope you enjoyed today's episode. If you did, take a moment, subscribe to the channel, hit the bell so you'll be alerted about new videos as they come out. Leave a comment, give it a thumbs up, share it across social media. And if you can, contribute to the page. You can do that in two ways. One, hit that super thanks button below or head on over to Patreon. You'll see the link at the end of the video where you become a patron of the page. We have different levels, monthly, yearly uh, uh, providing you can do or one time. Different ways that you can basically support this channel so that we can bring you the behind the scenes of maritime shipping. Until our next video, this is Sal, signing off.